we will now derive Poisson's formula, which is a closed form solution in the 19th century sense for Laplace's equation on the unit disk for arbitrary boundary conditions f of theta. First thing we're going to do is rewrite the general solution, so to speak, this inf general infinite sum, in complex terms and take full advantage of this uh, geometric series field. Okay, so here's what it will look like. Because we're following the Fourier series, the recipe will be the same with one little caveat, which is whatever the boundary condition is, decompose it as a Fourier series and then multiply each term by r to the n, almost. And because as we discovered, we only are able to keep positive powers from the solution to the radial part. Because the negative powers blow up at zero. And taking into account the fact that we're now doing a series from infinite, from minus infinity to positive infinity, so negative numbers are included also technically in the sum. We have to put the absolute value over n. So that e to the i5 theta and to e to the minus i5 theta both gets multiplied by r to the fifth. So you will see that this absolute value will actually go away. It's, kind, it's not nice to see absolute values, but fortunately they'll go away two-thirds of the way through the analysis. Okay, well now we can plug in what c sub n is, because we have a formula for c sub n for any boundary condition. It's the Fourier series of f of theta. So what we find Okay, pretty good. We have an infinite sum of a bunch of integrals. It's the sum of integrals. Is there a question? Yes, it's the boundary condition. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you should always retrace the steps. Whenever you're doing a long calculation and for a moment you, f you Forget your interpretation. That means you've kind of lost control a little bit. So you always retrace your steps mentally to the very beginning and remind yourself of where things came from and come back. That you have to always remain in control of the calculation. So it's a little bit of a mess because it's a sum, a number, an integral, and then a number and a number. So you can think of these two numbers because they don't involve alpha as being just constants inside the integral. And even this 1 over 2 pi, you can think of it as either being outside the whole thing or, right, so it doesn't matter. So we essentially have an infinite sum of integrals. And this is where a math major would hesitate and ask herself, is the sum of integrals equal to the integral of the sum? But an engineer or an applied mathematician will never hesitate. Because in most cases, yes, and the cases where it's not true for whatever technical reason or a very important reason, it's not true, but then it's that reason that deserves separate study. Right? Then when, when that's not true, it's the reason why it's not true that's the most interesting and important thing. We're doing a calculation where that's a secondary notion, so we're not going to focus on it. We'll consider a situation where, of course, everything converges as it should, as fast as it should, as smoothly perhaps as it should. And then of course it's true. So we're going to have integral of an infinite sum. And then what will be nice is that inside that integral, that infinite sum can be actually summed up because it will be a geometric series. All right, here's what we have. I'm going to leave p pragmatic and leave one over two pi outside. D alpha. I'm not quite sure where to write it because I'll think about what I'm keeping inside the integral and what's going outside the integral. Actually, let me erase it. Here is why I want to erase it. So I actually want my f of alpha, which, is very much, which very much depends on alpha, so it's central to the integral, actually has nothing to do with n. It has nothing to do with n, so it can be outside of the summation. To leave it inside the summation would be a distraction. 
It has to remain inside the integral, but does not need to be inside the summation because the summation is on n. Okay, that's why I hesitated. And then these two exponentials can of course be combined. It's e to the i n, they share the n, of theta minus alpha. And here is where the beauty occurs. Because when I was pointing here, I was saying it kind of looks like a geometric series. It definitely looks like a power series. What's the difference between a power series and a geometric series? A power series is a geometric series with funky coefficients, with arbitrary coefficients in front of each term. It would be more accurate to say that geometric series is a power series where all the coefficients are 1. So he, this, there isn't a formula for this because it depends on what c sub n are. But here, all of c sub n's essentially, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, well, all of the coefficients also look, are also exponentials. So this is very much a geometric series. And of course, we want to take advantage of this formula. But you have to be a little bit careful. This goes from 0 to infinity, and this goes from minus infinity to infinity. So there are really two geometric series in here. So we're going to break this up into two geometric series. One will go from 0 to infinity. The other one will go from 0 to minus infinity, and then we'll flip it, and then did you just notice that I double counted zero? The zeroth term I double counted, and the zeroth term, of course, equals one. Just it always equals one. So I'll have to subtract one. Okay. So I think I want to be very careful and just write it all out, broken up in this form. So it's going to go from minus infinity to zero. But because I'm all ready to use this formula, I'll switch from n to minus n. So instead of going from minus infinity to zero, it can go once again from zero to infinity. And I'll just put in minus n here. And I'll put in, OK, I'll, be very, I'll explain this part very carefully. And I'll put a minus sign here. Now remember that it's r to the absolute value of n. So even though I'm now plugging in, I'm switching n to minus n, this will remain r to the n. We only have positive powers of r. So that's where the absolute value, it appears kind of awkwardly, but then goes away very naturally. So it remains r to the n. Now I'm remembering the fact that I double counted the zeroth term, which is 1, so I have to subtract it. So number one, they look familiar. Number one second. Number two, they're perfect geometric series. Number three, they're complex conjugates of each other. Isn't that nice? Each term is a complex conjugate. So now we see that the combination will be real. So now we have two perfect geometric series, and we can add them in closed form. So here's what we get. I'll continue that equal sign. the sum of this infinite series, 1 over 1 minus r times e to i theta minus alpha. Plus, and I'm actually not going to write down what it will be, it will be 1 minus r times e to the minus i theta minus alpha. And I won't write it down because it's the complex conjugate of this. So I will actually, just to highlight it, I will just write it like this. It's the complex conjugate of this expression. It's the exact same thing with minus this. And then minus 1. Saves you some writing, number one, but also introduces some clarity. We see what's going on. D alpha. So because of this, we will get twice the real part of this. Two complex conjugates, the imaginary parts will cancel. We'll get twice the real part. So we're better determined what 
twice the real part of this is. Let's take it offline and write out that what this expression equals is 1. That's the complex number. We have to determine its real part, so we'd better convert it to the proper form by multiplying both the bottom and the top by the complex conjugate. Plus i doesn't matter what because we're after the real part of this. We're only interested in the real part. And on the bottom we'll have this squared plus this squared. Let's do that in our minds. Because when you say, when you have this squared plus this squared, we will have 1 squared plus this squared plus this squared. Well, that just adds up to r squared. Are you with me? Because there'll be sine squared of something plus cosine squared of the same thing. So we have 1 plus r squared. And the only part that's remaining is minus 2 this times this. I'll just do it right in place here. Okay, so remember that we need twice the real part of this. I will borrow it from here, so it will now be 1 over pi. No, I have to be careful because there's this 1 minus 1. So we'll just, we'll keep the 2 there. So equals. Okay, now I will say reclaim this space and we'll just write down the answer. I just imagine myself being the first one who ever did this and then realized that once you plug in the value of the coefficient, you have a geometric series which you can add in closed form. And the rest writes itself. It's exhilarating because it's like watching a movie. You have to do nothing that's challenging except sit there and watch. And then you, you get to discover how it ends. What can be more enjoyable? So let me just write down. How beautiful is this? As far as the 19th century is concerned, this is as final an answer as you can expect. This is what's called a closed form solution. And it's remarkable that it works for all boundary conditions f sub theta. And what's interesting is here's where that dependence on theta is. So in this expression, alpha is the dummy variable that's the integration variable. But this depends on both r and theta. And this is where r is, 1, 2, 3. And this is where theta is. And everything else is integrated away. So kind of beautiful. All right, this is called Poisson's formula. We'll use it for one thing only, for two things. Number one, to admire it. Take a moment. OK, good, it really deserves more than that. And the other one, let's use this formula to prove, so to speak, that the value of the function at the center of the circle, in other words, when you plug in r equals 0, is the average of the values on the boundary. We know that to be the, cr the true property, so it has to be part of this expression. So let's plug in r equals 0. On the bottom we have 1, and on top we have f of alpha. So the value at r equals 0 is simply 1 over 2 pi, the integral of f of alpha. Gorgeous. There you go. The proof is complete. <laughs> All right? That's Poisson's formula.